This week we're looking at Acts chapter 16 verses 9 through 15, the story of Lydia's conversion. So let me read that out of the New Revised Standard Version. During the night Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately crossed over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Luke likes to use people and places in his account of the early church to structure the book of Acts. Places tell us about the journey of the church. This allows us to follow in our mind's eye the journey of the church spreading from Jerusalem to Rome. It gives us neat little pinpoints to place on the map so that we can follow the expansion of the church. Without these geographical references, Acts would make little to no sense at all. Luke also uses geography to teach us theology. In Acts 1a, he records Jesus' last instructions to his disciples. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the farthest parts of the earth. And I'm reading out of the New Revised Standard Version this week. And in large part, the book of Acts is organized around this verse. This story opens with the disciples gathered in Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. He then traces the spread of the church from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, and by the end of the book, Paul is in Rome. Not quite the farthest parts of the earth, but pretty darn close to it for anyone who lived in Palestine during those days. People. Ah, the people we meet in the book of Acts tell us a great deal as well. They're included not just to develop and flesh out the story, but they communicate important theological concepts as well. A simple experiment you can do is to read the book of Acts and highlight the main characters in the different areas, and usually they're going to be named to make it easy, and then look at and think about what they're trying to communicate to us. In particular, Luke focuses on people who convert to faith in Christ. You could argue that the disciples and all the first believers on the day of Pentecost were converts. The next key witnesses he brings forward is Simeon the magician in Acts chapter 8. Simeon is most likely mentioned by Luke because he wants his readers to see the difference between those who practiced magic and the miracles being performed by the early church. Why? Because we know from the writings of critics of the early church that they accused the early believers of practicing magic. Later in Acts chapter 8, Luke brings forward the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, this person has come as far as possible to converting to Judaism, but his conversion reveals God's divine direction in taking the gospel to this man who is outside Israel ethnically, religiously, culturally, and physically. As a eunuch, he would have been castrated, most likely before he reached puberty. Eunuchs were usually slaves and used for domestic servants, concubines, sexual partners, or guards within the royal palace. Because he was not a whole person, he was missing certain body parts, and because he was most likely used for sexual purposes, he would have been seen as unclean according to the Jewish law. This would have meant that he could not fully participate in temple worship if he converted to Judaism. Yet in his conversation with Philip in the chariot, he asked, what is to prevent me from being baptized? A question that is theologically loaded. Because he couldn't worship in the temple, and there may have been questions about his being unclean in relationship to his coming in contact with others, Luke does not give Philip's answer. 
you have to supply it in the context there. Most likely, Philip said, nothing. The eunuch's conversion is groundbreaking in that he is not Jewish, but he is also a eunuch. All right, I have to interrupt myself here for a minute. The clip I shot where I discussed Paul's conversion did not turn out right. It was corrupted. So I just have to interject that here. In Acts chapter 9, the next big conversion we have is the Apostle Paul. And then really from chapter 9 to the very end of the book, it really follows Paul's ministry and his turn to Christ. All right, back to our Oh, oh, and I also need to let you know that yesterday it was almost 90 degrees here. Today, it is snowing outside. Absolutely crazy. This is what it's like to live in Colorado during the springtime. All right, back to our video. Then in chapter 16, we meet Lydia and the Philippian jailer. Now I'm going to focus on Lydia's conversion in this video, and we're going to have to leave the jailer to cover later. Let me just take a moment here to let you know that you're watching the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and for the past 20 or 30 years, I've been teaching seminary in various countries around the world. The goal of these videos is to take what I've been teaching within the classrooms at seminaries and bring it to you on YouTube so that you can read your Bible in a deeper and more profound way. So if you find these videos useful, please do me a favor and subscribe, give them a thumbs up, and share them with those that you know. Now, where was I? Ah, yes, Lydia. Lydia's story is significant for both personal and geographical reasons. To grasp this, we need to go back and look at Paul's second missionary journey to see its context. At the end of Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas separate ways after their first missionary journey. Paul then starts out on his second missionary journey, revisiting the churches that he founded on his first trip. So we're doing follow-up and strengthening the churches there. Acts chapter 15, verse 41. During his time visiting those churches, he picks up his trusted sidekick, Timothy, in the city of Lystra. Paul's missionary band then travels across modern-day Turkey and ends up in the northwestern corner of the land, in the province of Mysia. It appears that Paul's plans were then to turn back northern and eastern and strike out across the northern coast of Asia Minor. It's at this point that Paul has a dream of a Macedonian, a Greek, pleading for Paul to come help us in Acts 16.9. It's at this point that we need to stop and consider what's happening here from an ancient reader's point of view. From a Greek or Roman reader's point of view, Paul is in Troas in Asia Minor, Asia. He is not in Rome or what we would call perhaps Europe from today's perspective. For someone living in Israel, or where the church is up until this point in time, Paul is about to leave their culture, Asia, and move into the uncharted Greco and Roman cultures. Paul is in Troas, where he has his vision. And Troas is seen as a boundary city or point in the distinction between cultures. The Trojan War was a clash between European and Asian kingdoms. When Alexander the Greek crossed the Hellespont, Greek historians saw this as his entrance into Asia from Europe. Greek and Roman historians divided their world between Europe, Greece and Rome, and Asia, with whom they had a long history of fighting bitter wars. Africa and Egypt was separated from Europe by the Mediterranean Sea. Luke's readers would have immediately realized that when Paul decides to sail from Troas to Macedonia, he was making a huge shift in ministry and cultural locations. He was moving from one civilization to another. Now, as the church spread from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth, Paul is taking the gospel in sort of a reverse direction. He is going from Asia to Europe, not like Alexander the Great, who went from Europe to Asia. 
So geographically, Lydia's story is one of the big developments in the book of Acts, geographically. Now let's consider her as a person. Why is she put on par with the Ethiopian eunuch, Cornelius, or the Philippian jailer? After Paul's dream, the missionary band sets out from Troas by boat to the island of Samothrace, and there to the port of Neapolis. From there, they end up in Philippi, where they spend some days. This is Luke's way of saying that they spent quite a bit of time there. In contrast to other cities that Paul had planted churches in, Philippi does not have a synagogue, so the Jewish believers gathered by the river to pray. This is a practice that some think was derived from Psalm 137, verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. It is here that we meet Lydia, and Luke includes several key points to describe her. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. We don't know much about her name, except that it appears to have been a Latin name first that was then translated into Greek, Lydia. Second, we're told that she was from Thyatira. Now I'm going to come back to this in a moment. But this is a city on the very western edge of Asia Minor, near Ephesus, as mentioned in the book of Revelation. Third, she was a seller of purple or purple cloth. Now, why does Luke take the pains to tell us what color of fabric she sold? In the Roman Empire, there were some rules governing who could wear what. Slaves had a certain style of dress and even hats, that they had to conform to so that everyone knew that this person was a slave when they were in public. And purple was a color that was highly regulated. Depending on the time and where you lived, this color was restricted to only members of the Roman Senate, high-ranking officials, let's say perhaps a governor, and members of the ruling aristocracy. I mentioned a while back that I would come back to Thyatira. Now, Thyatira as a city was known for the quality of dyeing that they did to cloth. So her being in Philippi and coming from Thyatira are linked by her trade. And the implication is, is that she had houses in both locations for her business. The fact that she dealt in purple cloth tells us a great deal about the circles in which she moved. This is not your average business person. Her clients would have been the very who's who of the Roman Empire, the very top 1% of the 1% of their society. In verse 12, we're also told that she has a house. Now consider this for a moment. 40 to 60% of the people who lived in the Roman Empire were slaves. A slave did not own a house or a place, but slept wherever their master told them to sleep, most likely on a mat on the floor. The average person who was not a slave, a freed person, lived in a one or two room shack or apartment in the Greco-Roman cities. They had no plumbing, no water, and these were cramped, crowded living conditions, probably at least five to ten people per room. But if you were wealthy, you owned a house. I'm going to have some pictures of houses from Ephesus here so you can see how big they were. They had multiple rooms for eating and cooking relaxing, entertaining, maybe an office and bedrooms, perhaps a central hall with a large fountain in it to keep the house cool. They had indoor plumbing. Not many owned houses like Lydia did. There's an excellent book on this whole topic called A Woman's Place by Osik and McDonald, and I'll have a link to it underneath this video if you're interested. They do a great deal of research sociologically, historically, and archeologically on the role that women played within the houses and then how that affects how we read Paul's letters in the New Testament. Critics of the early church often used the fact that the early church met in houses where women exercised a great deal of authority and influence as a reason why no reasonable person should believe in this faith. Lydia's conversion and the fact that she persuades Paul and his company to stay in her house helps explain and give a defense to the early believers against criticisms like this. 
All you have to do is read through Paul's letters and see all the women who play influential roles within the churches that he planned to see why Lydia's conversion was so important for Luke to include in the book of Acts. As I close this video, I want to read from Psalm 67, which is included in the lectionary reading for this week. And I want you to notice how many of the themes in the book of Acts and Lydia's story are echoed in this psalm. Psalm 67, verse 1. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May his face shine upon us. That your way may be known upon the earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, has blessed us. May God continue to bless us. Let all the ends of the earth revere him. Amen. Amen.